Hello, I'm Raj Chengappa from India today and your host for Nothing But The Truth. Every week we will deal with key issues of concern and bring you perspectives and clarity as to why these matter to you and what is the clear truth that emerges. I'd gone to Ahmedabad to interview Gautam Adani, chairman of the multi-billion dollar Adani group for India Today this December. Adani was then literally on top of the world. The self-made billionaire had become India's richest individual and the world's third wealthiest with his personal wealth pegged at over $120 billion. Gautam Bhai, as he likes to be called, told me that such rankings were inconsequential to him and he said, I get my thrills from handling challenges. The bigger they are, the happier I am. Now, a month and a half later, Gautam Adani is facing the biggest challenge of his career and currently he must be far from happy. On January 24th, the New York-based Hindenburg Research came out with a sensational report that leveled a series of allegations against the Adani group. It accused the group of, among other things, indulging in stock market manipulation, accounting fraud and using offshore shell companies to artificially raise its share value in violation of Indian laws. The Hindenburg research openly admitted that it was a short seller and stood to benefit if the Adani stocks fell, a practice that is legal in the United States. It listed as many as 88 charges against the Adani group and the Adani group gave a detailed point-by-point -point rebuttal to the charges leveled by the Hindenburg group and denied all the allegations. But the damage had been done. The impact of the Hindenburg report was immediate and unprecedented. The Adani group shares plummeted. The group lost a staggering $120 billion, which is nearly rupees 10 lakh crore in investor wealth in just a week's time. Two weeks after the savage assault on its reputation, the group's market capitalization of its nine companies listed on the exchanges stood at just rupees 9.8 lakh crore. That was nearly half its valuation two months ago. Katha Madani himself had slipped to 17th place on the Forbes wealthiest list and lost his distinction as India's richest, with his personal wealth also being halved. He also became the center of a massive political controversy that has put the Modi government on the mat ahead of the 2024 general election. The opposition, spearheaded by Congress leader Rahul Gandhi, charged Prime Minister Narendra Modi with favoring Gautam Adani. Both Gautam Adani and Prime Minister Modi belong to Gujarat and charges of them being close have been made much earlier too. The opposition now is pushing for a joint parliamentary committee to investigate the entire matter. There were three big questions raised by the fallout of the Adani controversy. The first is, will the damage done to the Adani group impact the country's financial stability? The second is, can the Adani group recover from its precipitous valuation losses? And the third is, will the Modi government face a political blowback. In this episode of Nothing But The Truth, we will explore answers to these three critical questions. Now let's look at the first question, which is, will the damage done to the Adani group also impact the country's macroeconomic and financial stability? Adani is, after all, India's largest private sector power producer ports and airports, operator, consumer gas business and electric transmission company. In addition, he is the largest infrastructure developer and generator of renewable energy in the country. The group has also big plans in the solar, wind and green hydrogen fields and has made or making massive investments in these green projects. If Adani falls, the reverberations will be felt across the economy. The total gross debt of the company is around rupees 2 lakh crores. That's massive by any standards and is around 4% of India's annual budget. So will the country see a financial meltdown of the economy 
if the Adani group for some reason collapses totally? The short answer, it is unlikely. And here's why. A top financial ministry official whom I spoke to off the record told me this, and I'm, I'm quoting him, the public sector banking and financial institutions of India that have invested in Adani do not have such a large exposure as to cause what is called a first order attack. He also said, moreover, Adani is no fly by night operator, but a company that has a solid valuable base and assets, particularly in the infrastructure sector and which they have placed as collateral for taking on the debt that they have. And then he added as a caution, of course, allegations such as stock manipulation leading to inflated prices of the group shares, apart from its investments from offshore companies in tax havens needed to be looked into. So let's decode what he said and why he said this. The first point is whether the investments made by the public sector financial institutions such as the Life Insurance Corporation or LIC and the State Bank of India are a cause for concern. Both LIC and the SBI were quick to point out that their exposure to the Adani group was below 1% of their total lending and was backed by collaterals and that there was no immediate reason for concern. What has also helped is that in the past nine years, the Adani group has steadily reduced its borrowings from Indian banks. Gautam Adani, in his interview to me before the Hindenburg crisis, said that he had brought down his borrowings from Indian banks from as much as 86% of the group debt to around 32% now. He also told me that almost 50% of his group's borrowings were through international bonds. Foreign financial institutions would have invested in his group only after tremendous due diligence. This development in many ways has assuaged any panic investors may have had over the falling value of his shares. Also, India's mutual fund industry have so far not made much investment in Adani shares. That is why a large number of retail investors have been spared the impact of Adani's share prices falling. The reason they do so was because most asset management companies believe Adani stocks were overvalued. Meanwhile, Union Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaram addressing a post-budget India Today conclave made it clear that India's macroeconomic fundamentals have not been impacted by the Adani episode. And as an example, the finance minister said, India's foreign exchange reserves have grown by $8 billion soon after the revelations. She also said, regulators such as the Securities and Exchange Board of India or SEBI will do their job on the issue, but didn't elaborate further. That brings us to the second big question. Can the Adani group recover from its precipitous valuation losses? Or will its stocks plunge further? It is difficult to answer this, but the key to it would be SEBI's investigations into the whole affair. The Hindenburg report, in fact, raises several major issues that the RBI, SEBI, and other regulatory agencies need to examine. I will mention only a few. A key Hindenburg allegation is that the Adani companies have taken on substantial debt, putting the group on a precarious financial footing. As mentioned earlier, the Adani group's total debt is around Rs 2.3 lakh crore. Sources close to the group say that discounting cash reserves of, of around Rs 30,000 crores, the debt is trimmed to around Rs 2 lakh crore. The group claims it has gross fixed assets worth Rs 3.7 lakh crore. Along with that, the assets generate a cash EBITDA or earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization of close to Rs 60,000 crores annually. What the Adani group is in effect saying is that it has enough cash as well as assets to service its loans and meet any other financial eventualities that may arise. Ashwat Damodaran, a professor of finance at the Stern School of Business at New York University, in a blog said recently that one of the big concerns is Adani's quest for greater family control. Now, SEBI mandates that the maximum shareholding by promoters 
should not exceed 75% and that the rest should remain public shareholding. The Adani Group structure as of November 2022 held an average of 70 to 75% of the total shares in most of their group holdings. While it is still within the law, market sources say that this shows that the family's immense control over the businesses and it leaves room for inflating share prices if regulators are not vigilant. Another damaging point by Damodaran pertains to the price to earnings ratio or PE ratio of Adani Enterprises. This has gone from just 15 times in 2016 to 21 period to 214 times in the past two years. I'll repeat that 214 times in the past two years. The PE ratio is a, it is a technical uh, term, but it is a measure of the company's value through a comparison of its current share price relative to its per share earnings. It gives companies better valuation and makes it easier for them to raise finance from the markets. This brings us to another allegation, which is that the Adani stocks have seen a phenomenal rise in their market capitalization in the past five years and that the stock values have been artificially inflated. Damodar believes that the Adani Enterprises stock should be priced at something like 40% lower than its current share value. The group, the Adani group denies any allegation of manipulating the PE ratio and share prices and maintains that experts like Damodaran are not factoring in the solidity of the group's growth and that they say is one of the main reason for its high share prices. The more damaging of Hindenburg's charges related to the shell companies. The report alleges that Adani has a raft of shell companies based in Mauritius which are used to buy shares and thus retain greater promoter control of the group. The Adani group denies it has misused the Mauritius connection and says that every dealing it has had over there is above board and confirms to the existing law. Despite all these allegations, no one should underestimate Gautam Adani's ability to fight back. He is a fighter by instinct and he sees any crisis as an opportunity. In his worst hour of business, Gautam Adani quickly put together a four-phase strategy to correct the share prices and put the growth back or the group back on a high growth trajectory. In the first phase, he took a bold decision on the group's follow-on public offer or FPO of rupees 20,000 crores from the market. Despite it being fully subscribed, he returned the money to all the subscribers as they had brought his shares at over rupees 3,000 per share, but this had dropped to rupees 1,500 per share, which caused them immense losses. Gautam Adani said that it was not morally correct for him to keep the money. Then, to instill more confidence in the investor community, the promoters of the Adani Group companies repaid as much as $1.114 billion, which is around rupees 9,217 crore, before time to release some pledged shares in several of the group companies. The move yielded immediate results. On February 7th, after they did it, most of the Adani Group companies' shares showed a sharp uptick. Sources close to the Adani Group say that releasing the pledged shares was to demonstrate the liquidity available with the group and arrest any panic selling. This is the first phase of the Adani Group's firefighting strategy. Now the next two months will be critical for Dani. One of his biggest roadblocks will be on the financing front. Experts say that he will find refinancing the group's existing loans difficult, as well as raising new funds from banks and the capital markets. So in the second phase of Adani's strategy, the group will be working very closely with banks to de-risk from volatile share price movement. The group will also come out with its capex plans or capital expenditure plans and credit profile to chalk out a long-term strategy spanning six months to 10 years. In the third phase, the group plans to agree to additional covenants on what it will disclose to the market from a bondholder's perspective because they know they will now need to be held or will be held to closer scrutiny. And in the fourth phase, 
The group plans to present its businesses in a completely de-risk manner and consolidate all the current ventures while going ahead with its expansion plans. Through these four phases, the first two are already under implementation according to sources. The Adani group hopes to recover investor confidence and get their stocks back on a more even keel. But it will be a while before it reaches the stratospheric levels it had reached in December 2022. When I interviewed Gautam Adani before the crisis broke out, he told me that he is a born optimist. Because of his recent actions to stem the crisis, the group now appears confident of weathering the storm. Which comes to the third and final question. Will there be a political blowback for the Modi government? And I will give you a short answer. You would have all seen or listened to the heated debate in Parliament. The opposition mounted the attack on Prime Minister Modi, Narendra Modi and his alleged close links with Gautam Adani. Congress leader Rahul Gandhi in the Lok Sabha expanded the ambit of charges beyond the Hindenburg report. He listed several other issues, including aviation and defense deals, which he alleged that the Prime Minister had favored Gautam Adani with. On his part, the Prime Minister unleashed the full might of his oratorical skills. He lashed out at what he termed as the ecosystem of corruption and inefficiency that made 2004 and up to 2014 the lost decade of India. This was the year, if you remember, or this were the years that you, you would remember that the Congress led UPA ruled. The Prime Minister and Parliament contrasted it with the development initiatives marking his tenure. The BJP strategy seems to showcase the Prime Minister's impressive record in terms of development and the fact that no scandals had besieged his government as it had happened during the UPA period. Significantly, the Prime Minister made no mention of Adani or any promise of a pro. Much will now hinge on whether the SEBI and RBI have performed their roles and whether the Adani group had not broken any law as alleged by the Hindenburg report. Especially with regard to the alleged offshore shell companies in Mauritius that had been set up by the group. If these two agencies are found wanting in their watchdog role, it will have serious political repercussions for the Modi government. Then the opposition charge that the Modi government favored Adani would sound credible. Meanwhile, the government will have to demonstrate that the country's financial dealings are conducted fairly and transparently. Also, the regulators will need to maintain strict vigilance so that the shine on the India story remains real and the country's reputation is not sullied. For more details of the fallout of the Adani controversy, read the cover story of India Today magazine, where I, along with my colleague M.G. Arun, have gone in depth into the issues with telling graphics and charts. Thank you for listening to this episode of Nothing But The Truth. I look forward to having you with me on the next show.